welcome to the Legal Edition. I'm your host, Attorney Mary Kay Aloyan. Our show topic today is our oceans, our survival, one earth. Our guest is Dr. James McCarthy. He is the Alexander Agassi Professor of Biological Oceanography at Harvard University and is the former director of Harvard's Museum of Comparative Zoology, a title he held for 20 years. Throughout his extensive career, Dr. McCarthy has researched and authored numerous publications on climate change in the context of multiple stressors and resilience of the plants and animals that inhabit our oceans and estuaries. To his credit, Dr. McCarthy was one of the lead authors on the final chapters of the first intergovernmental panel on climate change. Let's welcome Dr. McCarthy. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mary Kay. Thank you. Now, as a contributing member of the IPCC, um, you were privy to information on climate change um, that the general public and the mainstream media are not. Um, can you elaborate on the IPCC and what it does and how it works? Sure. Um, it, um, it, it began actually in the late 80s. Uh, it is a product of two intergovernmental bodies, the World Meteorological Organization, which I think all nations belong to. It's the body that collects the meteorological information from different nations, compiles it, computes statistics for the globe, provides a lot of guidelines and methodologies as to how to do that. And the other body was the United Nations Environment Program. And a decision was made in the late 80s to bring together a group of scientists to see if we could distill the information that had been percolating up through all the scientific publications over the previous couple of decades about maybe an unusual period uh, for climate, one in which we were seeing changes that we hadn't seen before. And one uh, intent of that was to produce a document that could inform the United Nations uh, body that was looking at whether or not some sort of, of a treaty, some sort of agreement among nations with respect to climate change uh, should be considered. So the report came out in 1990, and it was then uh, used uh, as background information for the United Nations Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change. Uh, this particular uh, convention is the one that was introduced at Rio. Uh, in 1992 at the Earth Summit, uh, which was the largest gathering of heads of state ever at that point in time. It was uh, attended uh, by then President Bush. Uh, he actually signed uh, this treaty. It was ratified by the U.S. Senate in October that year, and at some months later, enough nations had ratified it to put it in force. So it was very important in informing uh, world leaders about uh, climate change and giving a sense of what might happen if we didn't begin to address climate change. That convention, um, which has in it all sorts of lofty goals, avoiding dangerous interference in the climate system without defining what dangerous is, mm -hmm. it also said we should roll emissions back to the 1990 levels to be certain that we did not enter into dangerous space. It then continued um, roughly every five years, it's a little longer now, six or seven years, to provide updates on climate science. Mm -hmm. And what has been the consensus over the years from 1990 to now? Um, there's quite a period there to uh, gather data. What is the consensus well, at this Well, let me point? give you just a couple examples. So, of course, the science evolves. Mm -hmm. We are learning more and more, and of course, we're seeing more and more change. So, you're now conducting studies we wouldn't have even imagined 30, 40 years ago because we're seeing changes in parts of the system that we didn't anticipate or didn't know we could measure, new capabilities have come into place. So let me give you an example. Uh, in 1995, there was not any strong evidence that sea level rise was uh, changing in a way that might look like a strong upward trend. It maybe looked like a gradual trend, but we'd say accelerating, getting faster and faster. In 1995, there was no statistical evidence that we were seeing changes in extreme events that is, um, more persistent droughts or heavier rains, um, wet or dry spells. Um, in 1990, uh, there was still no evidence that we were seeing widespread uh, implications of climate change for, um, for natural systems, um, for insects, for birds, for mammals, mm -hmm. for plants. By 2000, just over that period of time, so inklings of things that caused us then to to many scientists say, well, we better look at this more carefully. New research is done. 
a research that maybe was buried in archives because it, you know, people had been following these things but hadn't really published it now begin to appear in the literature. So over that period of five years, by 2000, 2001, we now saw evidence that sea level rise was accelerating, in part because we had a longer time series of data. Satellites began monitoring sea level in 1993, so now we had more, five more years of that. For the first time, we could see evidence of the changes in distribution of plants and animals on every continent. Through satellite monitoring? No, again through, um, in some cases, uh, digging into data sets that people hadn't thought to really mine for this before, like how about the flowering time over in a particular period for particular plants um, over a period of decades. Um, you know, the data may be there, but people hadn't looked at it. In some cases, satellites, um, new sensors. Um, for the first time, you could now see statistically that uh, we are seeing, in many areas, longer dry spells, uh, heavier rainfall, uh, less snow. Um, for the first time, you could see uh, globally that there is a pattern of glacial retreat. Some areas, the conditions are favorable growing glaciers, some not, but you can see a general pattern. So, so by 2000, a lot of this crystallized. And it is in 2000 that you find the first statements that say most of the warming in the last 50 years is due to human activities. So, so the science progresses and the IPCC reports uh, present that, that updated summary of the science. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk a little bit about the IPCC report and, and how the data is actually accumulated and peer-reviewed and uh, verified um, to ensure that it is accurate. Could you elaborate? Sure. So, first of all, um, a team of authors is selected to, mm -hmm. to produce these reports, and it's, that in itself is an involved process. Every nation is invited to, to nominate authors. And uh, excuse me, by nom authors, I, I suppose you mean scientific uh, statisticians? Scientists, scientists um, who know this body of science, who could then be uh, authoritative mm -hmm. in, in writing about it from all the published literature on a particular subject, and it may be more statistical, it may be more physical, it may be more mm -hmm. biological and chemical mm -hmm. and so on. I see. Um, and so I headed uh, the working group on impacts, adaptation, vulnerability. There are three working groups. I headed that one for the, the 2000, 2001 third assessment. And I had a stack that was about this tall of, of resumes from the nations that had submitted their suggestions. There were a thousand of these. And I went through every one of them, and I found that there were 80 who were absolutely key people for this report, who had some special expertise that I knew could deal with this body of information. Invited all those 80, they all said yes. And then we fi with, filled out the rest of the authors. I think we had 170 authors on that report. Well, that's quite a bit. And this is a, you know, it's a thousand page report, mm -hmm. it's like this. Uh, um, so some, one of the ground rules is the only information you can use is something that's already in the scientific literature in a reputable journal that has been peer reviewed. Mm -hmm. So it has an editorial process, authors submit a paper, it's sent out by the editor, experts review it, it's maybe accepted, maybe accepted with modification, maybe sent back for serious revision or rejected. So only something that goes through that process is on the table for mm -hmm. consideration. So then uh, the authors of the various chapters draft their understanding of the science it's then sent out to all the participating governments, which um, in any one IPCC um, process, I, I don't know what the number is now, but it's probably 140 or so governments that participate. Uh, they send it to any scientist they want to in their nation or mm -hmm. anywhere else and say, did these guys get it right? Mm -hmm. All that comes back. The IPCC also sends out to experts who are not authors, say, okay, you weren't involved in this, did we get it right? And then editors for each chapters look at all those criticism, all the criticism, all the critiques, and the authors of the chapter are required to address mm -hmm. each and every comment. Mm -hmm. And so, in the end of the day, we have you know, a ledger that checks off, well, this comment, someone really mm -hmm. missed the boat, this is not what we're saying, okay, ignore that one, this, this is important, you better fix this. Mm -hmm. Oh, you overlooked this. So, the process is of that sort. It goes on again. Mm -hmm. The governments get another shot at it. Mm -hmm. And then, the part that is most, um, most contentious in some regards, and particularly I think in the eye of some people in the public, is the distillation of this into a very short document. Right. So we have a thousand pages. Mm -hmm. We distill it to something that's about a hundred, a technical document. 
And from that, something that's more like 20 or 30 pages, which is called the Summary for Policymakers. And here the challenge is to put that language into a form that a non-scientist can understand. Now, scientists are terrible at this. I mean, you know, we, we, we talk in our own jargon. We forget that people don't know these acronyms. And, and well, it happens in, in every, every type of academia yeah. uh, where there is going to be uh, a mishap. Or, But in, in your particular instance, I know the media had pounced on one particular aspect. I, I believe it was the fourth IPCC report um, where there was a typographical error. Did you want to elaborate on sure, that? Sure, I can say something about that. But let me, let me sure. come back one moment and just say there's, there's another really important consideration okay. there. And that is that summary for policymakers has to be understood unambiguously in all the UN languages, not just English. So when you write a statement that has a word like most in it, mm -hmm. I, when I just use most of the warming, or maybe you say with a few degrees warming, something would happen. How does few translate into Arabic? How does it translate into Chinese? How does it translate into Spanish? And so part of the process in this big plenary with, with delegations from all the nations there who've, who've read this, every word, is to go through it line by line. It's projected on a screen. And as head of that group, I literally gaveled every <laughs> sentence go through it. And someone would say, I disagree with that. That's wrong. Well, every explain. sentence. And, and so we literally we call it a line by line review. And we're using track change. And so you put the changes up. At every break, you print out the revised statement. You give it to people. Make sure you got it right. And so it literally, literally, it's called line by line. It takes four days. We finished at 2.30 in the morning. Talk the about a day. line item veto, huh? Yeah, right. <laughs> it is. And now that's interesting, too, because there is no voting. It's a consensus process. And if someone raises a really absurd objection, mm -hmm. I can tell you one, uh, one delegate said, um, your statement about future water shortages is wrong. Strike it. And I said, explain. And I won't name the nation, but this delegate said, um, the oceans are infinite. All you have to do is take the salt out. And my thought was, yeah, fine. So how do you do that? You send a, build a pipeline to every nation that isn't on the shore and a second pipeline with free oil. I mean, how do, how do they take the salt out without energy? Now, nobody else was going to support that ridiculous statement. Mm -hmm. You look around, you just keep going. So some of them are, mm -hmm. you know, you can ignore. But by and large, if someone raises a serious objection, other nations will agree, and then we have to work it mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the one you referred to was actually not in the summary for policymakers in the, in, the, um, in the fourth assessment, where there's a statement about Himalayan glaciers mm -hmm. perhaps being uh, basically gone by 2035. When the report came out, I, I actually read that line. I thought, well, that, that's impossible. In fact, that sentence, it doesn't even make sense. There's some missing words. And it's at the bottom of the page, and it refers to the table. The next page, you turn the table, turn the page, here's the table, and it lists the glaciers and the data for their rate of, of, of mm -hmm. loss. And you say, well, it's, there's something wrong, because this shows this is centuries away, not decades. So there was something that was overlooked. If that had said 2350 mm -hmm. rather than 2035, it would have been just about right. So here was, you know, uh, do I make typos when I type? We all do. Do I, do, I, do I see them when I read what I've written? We Often all do. not. So this is something that became, you know, basically four numbers on one of a thousand pages of a report uh, for some people, serious reason to question the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So it was a silly, silly mm -hmm. ruse. You know, I always say, if our, if our Constitution was perfect, they wouldn't have had to amend it <laughs> several times. Yeah. So uh, with that said, um, you know, I can see leg legitimacy and, uh, in, uh, in what you're saying. Now, let's move on to what's really going on with our oceans. Um, you're there firsthand. You've been all around the world. What's really going on? The oceans are changing in ways I, I couldn't have imagined uh, when I began studying ocean science uh, in the mid-60s. Uh, if you had told me that we would see today warming at uh, depths of, of several uh, thousand feet in the ocean, I, I, I would have found that very difficult to imagine. Uh, in fact, it, when I was uh, first, uh, first began working in the ocean, uh, you could go out uh, to an area in the North Pacific and look at a depth of, of uh, maybe 6,000 feet at the historical data for temperature and to uh, you know, a tenth of a degree or a hundredth of a degree, it was the same. Uh, every, every time someone makes measurements 
over prior decades and today would be in agreement. Today that's not true. And, and we have, um, in fact, I remember distinctly uh, someone walking into my office in the, in the mid 1980s, I was 1986 or 87, saying, Jim, I think we're now seeing evidence globally the surface oceans have warmed. And I, I just remember being kind of jolted by that as we sat and looked at a new report. Mm -hmm. and, and it was clear that, that the oceans, which you know, are mixing constantly, the oceans are vast. The Pacific Ocean is huge. Most people don't realize how big it is. 42% of the surface of the Earth is that one big ocean. And so to imagine that all, you know, wind mixing and, and the transport of heat from the surface to depth that you could see this, this change over all the oceans uh, was a, a kind of a jolt. And of course, we've seen many other changes in the ocean that were not imaginable uh, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, the depletion of so many of our major fisheries, uh, the changes in those ecosystems, the shifts now as a result of, of warming conditions and, and, and certain species having been extracted uh, excessively, which have changed the relationships in those food webs. And some are collapsing, as we've been reading uh, in the newspapers and on uh, mainstream media, they are actually collapsing. We're losing starfish, we're losing oyster populations, yeah. and, um, and others are getting sick. So, so there's, in, in terms of, I mean, the oceans are a very important part of, of climate. Um, the ocean and the atmosphere interact. Uh, they they absorb heat at the low latitudes and currents move it to higher latitudes. So around the equatorial band, um, we, have, we have the oceans absorbing heat that then gets moved northward and gets moved southward with major currents like, like the Gulf Stream off our coast here. Um, any, any projection of a future climate involves changes in ocean circulation. And, and those are uh, very hard to, to, uh, to, to predict with a mm -hmm. lot of confidence. That is, Certainly the major currents will be the same, but, but there are cycles in those, like the El Nino cycle, the cycle in the currents of the equatorial Pacific. And we don't know how some of that will respond to climate change. But the other a big change in the, in the oceans, which is now um, becoming more and more um, in the public consciousness, is the changing ocean chemistry, which is making it um, chemically more difficult for organisms that need shells to uh, make or maintain that shell. Is that is that called ocean acidification? What so you're talking about? Th that's that's the the sort of vernacular. Mm -hmm. um, the the oceans aren't literally becoming acid; they're just becoming less basic. Mm -hmm. So on the pH scale, you know, it goes uh, seven is neutral, below seven is acidic, above seven is basic. So they'll still be above seven, but but the f closer they go towards seven. Uh, the more favorable conditions are for keeping uh, calcium and carbonate as separate ions in the water rather than allowing them to remain together as a mineral calcium carbonate. Mm -hmm. And where that's really critical is for a lot of, of organisms that you think of, well, they have a shell, it's a robust shell like an oyster or a clam, but the critical part is the larva of those animals, which is a microscopic swimming form of the animal. And it's part of the distribution system of these, these bottom living um, uh, shelled animals like mollusks is that their larvae are carried by currents to other areas. They settle, they have a, a, a process in which they actually stop swimming, go attached to the bottom or like a muscle they would mm -hmm. attach or a clam they may, wouldn't necessarily attach and be on the bottom. And they have a critical period in which they have to make that first shell um, they have only so much energy, mm -hmm. they have so much time, because then they start functioning differently in the way they feed. Um, so what's and happening they, now? And if they can't make that first shell because, because it's now more difficult to do it, they die. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing now um, this phenomenon materialize, particularly along the Pacific Northwest Coast up into the Gulf of Alaska. Many of these animals have tremendous economic importance directly, uh, like oysters. Uh, clams, but some of them are also extremely important as food for other marine animals. So the, mm -hmm. the um, salmon, for example, in off the coast of Alaska, um, consume a lot of a, a swimming, uh, we call a pelagic 
mollusk, which has a very, very delicate shell um, that uh, one of these is called the sea butterfly that is a, it's actually a beautiful <laughs> animal. Um, and, and they are, are also showing the stress from this. So, so here, if, if this condition persists, and it will as long as we keep pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, because part of what goes in the atmosphere is absorbed by the ocean, it changes ocean chemistry, and, and until, we, until we arrest that process, this chemistry will continue to change, and these organisms will be at risk. Mm -hmm. um, what I did is I, I uh, went to the IPCC report um, of um, the latest IPCC report, and it, it has the data set that over a period of 261 years, from 1750 to 2011, the, in increase, the, the increase in carbon dioxide that uh, was reported was 40% uh, carbon dioxide. Methane, which is CH4, was 150%, and nitrous oxide, 20% respectively. What is going to happen if, if these trends continue? Well, those are, those are three of the important greenhouse gases, and uh, they all have different relative importance. They have different, um, different origins. Um, each of them, um, if you th uh, think of a strategy for limiting, it has you know, different strategies that, for, that you would use. Um, they're all natural products, so there are natural sources and sinks. In some cases, we have accelerated those. In some cases, uh, we have um, We've actually created new sources. So, um, with carbon dioxide, it's it's you know it's it's very very clear. We know where that increase has come from. And, and uh, what is that? That increase is is from uh, deforestation and the burning of fossil fuels. So, deforestation, we cut down trees. Um, in some cases, that product is actually burned. I mean, biomass burning, as we call it. Um, is a natural phenomenon. You have natural fires, but but we have, of course, many parts of the world um, cut forests for agriculture, as we did in this area of New England. Our four four bears did. Um, uh, it, our forests here have largely recovered. In some parts of the world, uh, that's uh, far more problematic because they don't have the rich soils that uh, that we have in in this area. Very thin tropical soils can can be depleted more. Uh, um, more extensively by agriculture, and then it's difficult for a forest to recover. Um, but the um, the burning of fossil fuels uh, have a distinct, um, what we call an isotopic fingerprint, in that um, what is that? They're old enough that they do not have any remaining carbon-14. So carbon-14 is a natural radioactive isotope that is very widely used in dating um, mm -hmm. any material that contains uh, organic carbon. Carbon dating. Yeah, carbon dating. So, so the fossil fuels, um, literally, they, we call them fossil fuels because they're old like fossils we find right. in the ground. Which is our oil our, and our gas. Our oil, our, our is natural gas. Is actually fossilized material. That's right. And so it's old enough that it doesn't have any of this isotope left. It's all decayed away. So you can see the distinct signature of that carbon entering the atmosphere as CO2, distinct from the carbon that we would exhale as carbon dioxide when we breathe or any animal. So, so it's traceable. So it is. It's traceable. Yeah. So, so this, this, this makes it very clear where this is coming from. Um, again, um, some fraction of that is absorbed by the ocean. Some fraction is absorbed by, I mean, there are areas that are being reforested now where forests are going back. Uh, and the net balance of that leaves about half of what we're releasing in the atmosphere. And and uh, about 40 percent of, of what's being released is being absorbed by the ocean, and that's what's contributing mm -hmm. to this change in ocean chemistry. Nitrous oxide, again, uh, different sources. Um, they're biological sources. They're industrial sources. The industrial sources are, are uh, various combustion processes, so the, 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 um, the combustion of a fossil fuel has a little bit of nitrogen that can come out as nitrous oxide. And methane is more complicated because, again, many natural sources. Um, but among the, the sources that humans have a major role in, it's the extraction of natural gas, which is not an airtight process. We lose some to leaks. Um, the transport of it, um, 
the pipes that run through our mm -hmm. cities. We, um, we know they all leak. We hear now and then about you know Explosions. a big leak and an explosion, but in fact, we know that our major cities, the, the aging pipelines carrying natural gas are a major source of, mm -hmm. of leak to the atmosphere. And then uh, natural gas is associated with, with oil and with coal. Uh, so when uh, oil is, is um, being uh, extracted from a well, oftentimes the people who are making business decisions say, well, there's not enough gas to be marketable, so mm -hmm. we'll just blow it off or right. flare it. Um, and with coal mines, right. it's, of course, it's the source of explosion in coal mines. Right, methane but, is but I think, um, Dr. McCarthy, what I think a lot of people don't realize is that methane actually becomes carbon dioxide, and it will be prevalent in the atmosphere for thousands of years. Isn't that correct? That's true. So, so carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, basically has no chemistry. It goes in as carbon dioxide, stays as carbon dioxide, comes out, is removed as carbon dioxide. Methane um, is... Um, Actually, we could think of it as decaying in the atmosphere. It, it interacts with uh, an oxygen and a hydrogen to form carbon dioxide and water. So it stays in the atmosphere about a you know 10 or 15 years, and then stays in the atmosphere longer as CO2. And the, mm -hmm. the, the perturbation we call it, the perturbation lifetime of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Say, so what's the lifetime of carbon? Well, you know, right here in this room. Uh, we're releasing carbon dioxide by our breathing. Is there any living plant around? It could mm. be taking it up. Uh, right outside, plants would be taking up carbon dioxide. But if you, if you have another source and you push it in, how long would it take for that, that source to equilibrate uh, back to the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the system coming balanced back to work? And that's on the order of hundreds of years. So methane, yes, you know, 10 or 15 years, but then afterwards, that carbon dioxide molecule will be persistent will be just like any other carbon dioxide molecule. all right let's move on uh, let's move on to um, Antarctica and the poles what are you seeing happening there uh, this is uh, this is the area where uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the concern arises about um, uh, the rapid rate of climate change um, I was uh, I was first uh, at the North Pole in the early 90s and a, a Russian icebreaker and and the ice was like 10 or 12 feet thick and this is kind of what you would expect to find from all the previous work that had been North, North Pole. Um, within a decade that had changed. In fact in uh, the summer of 2000 um, we were um, on another North Pole trip and uh, the reason for my being on this trip was uh, through our museum, which you mentioned, we mm -hmm. do natural history tours, and we had taken a group of, of, um, of friends of the museum on one of these trips. I was lecturing on climate change. And we got to the North Pole, and there was open water. And you'd never seen that before? Well, not only never seen it, but uh, the other three lectures on board, we had one from MIT and one from the American Museum of Natural History in New York, and we were all just flabbergasted. And within uh, a few days of our return, um, Someone heard we had these photographs, ended up on the front page of the New York Times, and, and uh, open water at the North Pole. And, and there were people who said, well, that's impossible. It can't be, um, what, you know, ice can't be disappearing that fast. And yet it was. Mm -hmm. And now we know, of course, that what's happened is um, not only is ice shrinking an area in the Arctic Ocean, each summer uh, it, it melts, grows back in the winter, and we're seeing progressively summer to summer it's, it, it, it over this trend mm -hmm. now of 30 some years of satellite data um, has become smaller and smaller. But it's also thinner. Mm -hmm. So we've lost about half of the thickness. So we see very little of that old ice anymore. The ice is now relatively thin um, and that thin ice can break up more easily. Winds can move it. And that's why if you, if you went as we did from northern Russia to the North Pole, you would today find mostly thin ice where you do find ice. And with uh, the right wind conditions, it can, can move out of the central Arctic. Well, we'll have to stop. This has been fascinating, but uh, we're out of time. <laughs> but you can view the rest of the interview with Doc McCarthy on the web at the Legal Edition at Unabridged. I want to thank our guest, Dr. James McCarthy, for his in-depth discussions and analysis on the health of our oceans, what we can expect, and what we can do to affect change for the better. For more information, please visit us on the web at thelegaledition.com. And as always, this is for informational purposes only, and we look forward to seeing you next time for more of the Legal Edition.